Yeah, uh, thank you very much. So how to implement anything in MPC? Well, kind of an open title. So here is an overview of the whole thing. Um, so quite some time ago in Bristol, we started uh, uh, working on this uh, compiler that would kind of optimize circuits and also represent MPC circuits in a concise format, and we have like a virtual machine for that. So that's the first step. Now we're in circuit world. Then going on from that, we have implemented ORAM as an MPC circuit, and this uh, it's not hard to see that this gives us uh, oblivious arrays or uh, oblivious memory, and that uh, Abi mentioned this allows to uh, implement secure Dijkstra. And then in the last step, and the last step is actually the the smallest one of those steps is that we have a, if you consider, yeah, take a set of uh, CPU instructions, so whatever addition and multiplication and a bit of branching and comparison and so on, so that can all be represented as a small circuit. And now we have a model where like every step we just like execute all of them and then kind of with some secret variables select the results. So we now have oblivious arrays, memory, and oblivious execution, of course, in connection with uh, oblivious array. And this essentially gives us an oblivious machine, or uh, you could say an oblivious uh, CPU. And we have implemented this, and we run it. And uh, as you can see, it is not particularly slow. Uh, it's not particularly fast. So with a lower memory of 1,000 entries, we are at 40 hertz. With a bit bigger memory at a million entries, it's just uh, it's just two hertz, so that's uh, yeah, a bit far away from your desktop CPU. So that's obviously not nice, but what is the real problem about this? Well, it is a lot of work, and you program your days and nights away, and in the end, it's apparently not so surprising that you can do this. So uh, what are we going to do about this? Well, we have learned this week that OT extensions are all the rage. So why not talk about OT extensions? So here is the surprise for you. I'm actually going to talk about OT extensions and uh, how we got malicious OT extensions for free. And this is uh, joint work with uh, Tor Fredriksen Tore from Aarhus University and Emanuel and Peter from the University of Bristol and myself. So uh, what's the general setup? So basically, at, uh, 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 there's basically this talk is going to be about two ideas. We have a new correlation check for uh, OT extension. And when I say OT extension, of course, it's more or less the passive OX extension that we know, and that I will show in a minute. And that from that, we want to uh, uh, generate speed triples. So that is those multiplication triples in extension fields of characteristic two, because unsurprisingly, OT is all about bits. And characteristic two fields are kind of bits where, well, bit strings where addition is XOR. So that's going to be the two parts of my talk. A short, remember, a short reminder about OT extension that we have all seen uh, this week quite a few times, including this morning. We start with a bunch of base OTs. And I'm saying here Kappa base OTs, and Kappa is more or less going to be our security or one of our security parameters. Then they can be relatively short or not. And if they're short, uh, we extend the length with a pseudorandom function. That is uh, this idea that uh, at least I know from the CCS paper. Uh, and then the next step is introducing the correlation. And this is basically where the whole situation becomes kind of symmetric because, as we will, as I will explain in a minute, correlated OT is somewhat symmetric, and this allows us to switch the reverse the role of sender and receiver, the so-called, uh, or like we could call it the transposition step, and then in the end you hash to break the correlation and basically whatever um, uh, break also the correlation with your original OTs. So and. Yeah, and of course, the critical step from the point of view of malicious security is the correlation step, because then the party uh, who's supposed to introduce the correlation could just cheat um, by not doing it properly. And uh, what I mean by that, we will see in a minute. So this should be rather familiar. We have a standard OT box that uh, uh, 
basically provides several OTs. So we have selection bits, we have two input strings on the right hand side because in the, in the final, in the extended OT, the sender of the base OT is going to be the receiver. So whenever I say receiver here, it's going to be the receiver of the extended OT. So yeah, the receiver inputs two strings and then there's a select bit and the sender, at least in the base OT, gets an output. The correlation step essentially means that the receiver slash sender is supposed to input correlated strings in that the XOR between these two strings is fixed. Now, this is all, uh, should all be known after this week. So I would like to view this OT box in a different way, namely that we don't think of it in a bunch of uh, strings, but we basically kind of go into a more mathematical world of matrices. So instead of a number of selection bits, we will have the left-hand side input a bit string X, and the right-hand side will input uh, two binary matrices of appropriate sizes, some parameters here. And basically, the matrix T is the matrix consisting of, the, of all the zero strings, all the first strings. And the Z is the matrix consisting of all the, uh, of all the basically different strings between the two strings. And, and then it's not hard to see that the output on the left-hand side is actually T plus DX times Z, where DX is the matrix with the diagonal X. And as we said, Z is the matrix of differences. And now we're basically just going to rewrite this. So in a correlated OT setting, the right-hand side is supposed to input not a matrix of strings, but actually only one string. And that should be, in fact, the one row that is just repeated all over the difference matrix, so to speak of. And then as an output, we we get this dx times z, or if the sender slash receiver is actually honest, this will be the tensor product. So, and this is essentially the, uh, the important step in the understanding of the rest of the talk. A uh, tensor product is simply the matrix consisting of all the possible bit products, or all the possible ends between all the possible bits from one string and the other string. So, and then in a last step, just a slight change, we just kind of delegate generating the random string T uh, into the box. And what we can see, what I call here MALT, is actually we have a symmetric box that takes two strings as an input and outputs a secret sharing of the tensor product of the two strings. And that's essentially how we will understand this correlated OT uh, for the rest of the talk. So now, of course, now that we kind of changed the view, we want to see, well, how does this uh, um, relate? How, how will errors play out in this view? So again, in an honest receiver, it's all nice and clear. We got a tensor product. We got a matrix of all the possible bit products. So this is simply the tensor product between the two strings written out. Now, there are some errors. So that means uh, the receiver is allowed to input the matrix Z, which is supposed to be the matrix with all the rows being the string Y. But instead, there could be some errors. And mathematically, it's very easy. So basically, the errors play out as an additional term, which is this DX. Again, that's a matrix with the string X in the diagonal, times the error matrix E. And we basically can see that we because of this multiplication with dx, we kind of multiply the bits with the errors, which in essence are just like the opposite of what they're supposed to be. But uh, as it was said before this week, essentially this means we get a selective failure attack later, because then when things go um, wrong, or like when, uh, when we check things at the later stage, we will know that, for example, the whether x3 is 0 or 1. Because if x3 is 0, the error will just disappear. If x3 is 1, the error will be there, and we will notice that later. So that's the selective failure attack. And it's also 
uh, easy to see that it doesn't, it doesn't really matter how many errors there are in a specific row, because essentially as long as there's one error there, this row is essentially tainted. So now here is the, uh, it is, one could almost say the simple idea how to check the correlation. So we start thinking an honest receiver, it's the Q and the T is a secret sharing of uh, X tensor product with Y. And that essentially means for the columns of those two matrices that if you add up the two columns, you have uh, uh, YJ times X for all columns. And then we just like have our little nice toolbox of tricks that we have used for ex uh, one of those, uh, one of the tricks we have used for speeds. And we want to check a bunch of things. Well, why don't we check, just check a random linear combination and use what is called the principle of deferred decisions, which, which essentially says like if, if something is wrong somewhere and we do, we, some, we do a random linear combination, with very high probability the result will be wrong anyway. And then the question is remaining is, uh, well, linear combination, that's, uh, that's good and well, but um, over what? And then there's uh, this other trick that we use that essentially we just confuse bit strings and extension fields a bit. And uh, obviously, mathematically, this is certainly uh, dubious, but you can see that um, the nice thing is, so addition, so we have a ring, versus a field, and addition is the same in both. It's both like, if you understand elements in a ring as a bit string, addition is XORing, bitwise XOR, and so it is in the extension field. And the only difference is that in the extension field we have a multiplication, whereas in, uh, in the vector, in the vectoring, um, we don't have that. But in a vectoring, we have the sure product, the component-wise product, that will kind of play out will, as we see later. So here's the simple protocol. Um, we sample some random coefficients uh, securely. Um, this is rather straightforward. Use uh, PRGs and some coin flipping with whatever hash function, random oracle, whatever you like. And then you simply uh, uh, send a linear random combinations of the columns of T and a really linear, r random linear combination with the chi's as coefficients of the bits y. And, well, obviously a bit is always, can always be seen as an element of a field. It's just zero, one. So every field has zero, one. And then the standard simply checks the linear <coughs> combination. And that's, that's all the protocol. So. Yes, yeah, that's of course important. So basically, uh, when I said like we confuse things, basically we started with big strings that, and then matrices, so that's more vectors over bits. And now we go to the extension field and do random linear combinations in the extension field. So how does, the error, uh, how, how does it play out if we have a dishonest receiver um, not really playing by the rules? Uh, again, we have Q and T, supposed to be a secret sharing of the tensor product, but in fact, it can just be the dx times z. And the uh, columns uh, of z, which we call uh, z1 and so on, and if we have a dishonest receiver, then those columns are not going to be all 0, 0, 0 or 1, 1, 1, uh, because other, if the columns are all like this. Obviously, all the rows are the same, and we're in the case of an honest receiver. So then, what does it, that, what does the check mean? Like again, we have the receiver has to send a V and a W that achieves the equation on the first line. And if we then insert Q, the col the Q chase, the columns of Q according to the quality above, we will see that Q chase is T J plus set J sure product with X. And that is um, a straightforward computation. Like if you don't see it right away, just, just believe me. So we, again, recall the receiver has to pre produce V and W and doesn't know X. And yeah, looking at it, you kind of get a feeling you have like on one hand, you have extension field. On the other hand, you have 
just two products of um, vectors. So that shouldn't be that shouldn't be that easy, considering that you don't know x, which appears on both sides of the equation. And again, the z chase they are not all like zero 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 because then the sure product is just zero or one one one, and then the sure product is just x. Um, so there's yeah there's some intuition, but the proof turned out to be not straightforward. I don't want to walk through for yes. That's the sure product. Oh, sorry, by sure product, I mean component, component wise product of two vectors. So that's the first entry times the first entry, second entry times the second entry, um, and so on. So basically, here it plays out that we have extension field on the left hand side, and we have bit vector world on the right hand side. So, yeah, a proof, a proof of this, as I said, turned out to be not so straightforward. I don't want to walk you through uh, five or six pages of proof, but I want to give you a slight intuition why it's not so straightforward. So again, on top, we again have the same, equa uh, the same equation we had on the page before. And now think of the following examples. So the receiver cook up, cooks up a matrix Z where the columns are all yeah. 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on. So essentially, the matrix Z consists of a row going 1, 1, 1, 1, and then we have 0, 0, 0, 0, and then 1, 1, 1, 1, and you have 0, 0, 0. And that's obviously dishonest, because in an honest case, we would have that all the rows are the same. And now, also, just for a second, assume that the X, which is the input of the, of the other side, has the following form, that the first two bits are equal, and the third and the fourth bit are equal. So that leaves quite a, a degree of freedom for the x, but it restricts the bit string x. And then if you just basically uh, compute it out, the sure product of zj times x, it is easy to see that this is x divided by 1 plus uppercase x. And uppercase x is essentially the, the variable we use for, um, for generating the polynomials for the extension field. And that is simply because you can turn it out the other way if like the first uh, if the first two element if the first two bits of x are the same, it's obviously the first bit times one plus uppercase x. And then just play it through up to the end. So basically putting that in in the equation above, we can see that we can construct a V, which is uh, actually constructed honestly as the Random linear, uh, random linear <coughs> sum of the TJs and W is of the special form of one plus uppercase X inverted times the sum of the linear coefficients. So that was maybe a bit fast, but I uh, also want, I also would like to proceed. But uh, yeah, please believe me. So the main point. <laughs> The main point I want to make here, so we have restricted, well, the important point is that basically we have restricted x in some, in, 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 in some sense, but x still has quite a degree of freedom. And in fact, what we can prove that if x is a, uh, like if the, a cheating receiver wants to assume that x is in some copper minus m dimensional space, then he will pass the check with success probability two to the minus m. And this is, is, this is like very close to the idea that, the, that such a receiver will have to guess m bits out of x. But it's not exactly because, as we saw in the example, it's more about guessing the subspace or about a relation between the bits. And I, so just as a reminder, basically, kappa is the, is the length of x. So basically, if m is 0, then we're like in the complete space. So, and if m is 0, then we succeed with probability 1. So basically, we have this relation that is actually already quite, uh, that we quite like. Like, the more you cheat, the less you succeed, and the more, uh, 
uh, and yeah, the more you have to assume about x. But I wrote almost sufficient because yeah, there is just a tiny bit missing. It's a bit of a technicality to actually get to the result you need, and that is after you hash, you really have a uh, if you hash and you restrict the number of hash squares, we work in the random oracle model, then you really get the result that uh, the receiver cannot cheat in the extended OT. So yeah, and what I kind of swept under the rock a bit is of course that we also have to uh, think about the other security. So sending a random linear combination of your data reveals something about your data. But the solution for that is easy, just like this got some some uh, letter bits of y and don't use them anymore and then you're, and then you're uh, essentially good. And because there's already, um, there's like secure randomness in there, so that's quite, that's quite good. Why is the long button? Sorry? Why is the long Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. So basically it's the output of the PRG, so yeah, yeah you extend, so it's yeah, you're good. Yes, that's exact. Yeah, no, you are right. It's not. That's the way how to answer a question in the <laughs> in the negative. <laughs> okay, um, that's all I wanted to say about the OT. No, of course not. Experiments. Um, uh, so we ran it. We implemented ten million OTs, eight threads, and you can see. I was lying a bit, so it's not for free. There is a difference between the two numbers, but you could say it's, uh, it's rather negligible. And also, just essentially half an hour ago, I got an email from my co-author saying that, uh, uh, that the wide area network numbers actually aren't correct because, um, yeah, they should be double. He, uh, he made a small mistake in the implementation. Yes? Uh, I think the LAN scenario is like really close network. Yeah, I, I think there might be even be like directly connected machines. I see. Yeah, to be honest, like this is very fresh and the implementation was done by my co-author. So I can't really comment on the details, but I know that we have like, for those kind of things, we have two, two dedicated machines that are directly connected. So compared to the best how many days of these do we um, So we only use, um, yeah, so there is copper base of these. I don't remember like what copper actually is, but copper is a security parameter, like you cannot, you cannot go lower. But... <laughs> Sorry? No. Oh, you don't No. I don't think so, actually. That, that would be a question for Peter. So, yeah, very recent work. Like, I'm sorry if I can't comment on everything. Okay, so let me uh, proceed, part two, uh, uh, towards speeds and <laughs> speeds triples. So, and basically this is a, uh, a brief look back at TinyOT. If you still remember, the, in tiny, tiny OT, there's some kind of uh, OT extension, like with correlation, and then checks it, and then does some amplification. Because, uh, as we saw, like if there's just like a little bit, if there's just a little bit of cheating, the check will be passed by high probability, and this gives like a bit of leakage, so we have to do amplification to get rid of that. Now in speeds, we actually do, um, in, the, uh, in the sacrificing step that we saw yesterday, or sacrifice, or like error checking, error, how did you call it in the talk even, error correlation check, something like that. Um, you, you essentially, you check your correlated randomness. So the question is, um, can we amplify without checking? And it turns out you can. So as a short reminder, uh, what is amplification? Amplification essentially is just um, uh, taking, uh, take, multiplying in a random matrix that kind of reduces the number of rows in that case. So uh, uh, from 3L to 1L, um, we found sufficient. 
So basically, both parties uh, multiply in this random matrix, and then you compute, uh, you compute it out, and it turns out that the result is a tensor product of mx uh, with y. In the case of the honest receiver, so that's good. Then we just understand uh, basically the the senders or whatever the right hand party side as mx. And we have the usual protocol to kind of correct that to an input that was actually chosen by the party. So how does it play out in uh, the case of this honest party? Well, again, we have this error matrix, and we just multiply the M onto the error matrix. So in a more graphic setting, what does it, what does it uh, mean? So let's first consider the case of a few errors. Well, then it actually turns out if just one bit kind of gets leaked or corrupted with, and then we, we amplify the whole thing. We have a lot of bits that are actually safe. So the output will be actually somewhat independent of the leaked bits. So we're good. And in the case of many errors, we will uh, basically the output will kind of be just a mess will have a high entropy that is unknown to the adversary, and we're basically guaranteed to fail the speeds sacrifice error correlation, uh, sacrifice correlation check later on. So we're also good. So a little, cor um, a little cheating disappears, a lot of cheating just blows in your face later. So you're good. And so we come to the protocol. So we, uh, an essential ingredient is exactly this amplified correlated OT. And as we saw earlier, correlated OT can be understood as a two-party multiplication box. So if you want to do many parties, we have to do that between every possible combination of parties. And then the uh, protocol is essentially the following. We uh, use the amplified correlated OT for the triple generation to multiply A and B. And in the next step, we use, the, we use leaky correlated OT to get the max. And I will uh, say in a minute why we actually can be leaky there. And in the end, of course, we run the speed sacrifice to make sure that everything uh, uh, worked out. And so far, we don't have an implementation because this is very recent works, but uh, we estimate that we're going to be 200 times faster than no usual speeds. And that is also because uh, in speeds, there are like sort of two flavors. There's modulo P for big prime numbers, and there is extension fields of characteristic two. And the SHE, the somewhat homomorphic encryption in, in the extension field case, isn't particularly efficient. That's why we can get uh, uh, a, a certain speed up here. So yeah, let me just uh, make a few comments on possible attacks. So we saw that cheating in the amplified OT either gets erased by the amplification or we will fail the sacrifice error detection check. Cheating in the leaky correlated OT, we, we will use the, we use the leaky correlated OT in a way that there can be a, a leakage on the bits of the Mac key. But if you think of it, that is not so much of a problem because the single bits of the Mac key don't protect any private information. It's the Mac key as a whole that ensures correctness. And of course, because like every cheating comes with the risk of detection, uh, of, of, of being detected, and then the protocol will abort. And if you, if you want to cheat with a lot of bits of the Mac key, that simply means that, that, uh, that the protocol will fail with overwhelming probability. And then there is also, there's also something why we actually have to tweak the speed sacrifice a bit. And this is the fact because now, unlike speeds where the protocol is kind of global, you, global, you encrypt something with homomorphic encryption and a new browse cause. Like here, we do everything pairwise, so you could use different inputs when talking to different parties. But um, uh, when, when you write all those equations down, you figure out this guarantees you to fail error detection. So yeah, and that basically means uh, you're good. 
So, and I want to conclude on the overview of, you could call it a tool chain. So basically, you start with base OTs, you introduce the, corolla, uh, the correlation, this gives you the leaky correlated OT, then you uh, check and use the hash functions to get extended OT, and then from extended OT, you introduce the correlation again, because that is what you need to get speed triples. So basically, the left path <coughs> is getting the triples, and the right path is getting the is getting the mac is getting the max and then the shares of the max and then is and because there we can take the we can take a, a shortcut in that we are using the mac key shares in the base OTs and the mac key shares are the same overall of the computation so actually we don't need to have a completely a completely extended OT to get there and I think that's all I would like to say. Thank you.